Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, which will highlight a captivating case study on the reinvention of operational excellence. GB Tech is sponsoring today's webinar, and we are joined by one of their clients who will be sharing a new perspective on continuous improvement, exploring how culture can influence processes, and uncovering the secrets of empowering employees. Without further ado, Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Madison, and uh, welcome to the audience. Um, I would like to walk you a bit into our case study and uh, subsequent to me, uh, Mark will give you a bit um, of insights on GB Tech. So let me um, share and start uh, actually with a short introduction of myself. Um, so I'm, my name is Sarah Geising Eggers. I'm German. Currently, I'm based out of Japan, so you actually reach me here at midnight. Um, but it's my pleasure to uh, present our use case to you. And in my line function here at Olympus, I'm working as a vice president for process and data excellence globally. So um, I work a lot um, with uh, business process management and um, obviously as well with data management and the governance around this. And uh, this is all what I want to bring a bit more closer to you today. I'm not sure for everyone who knows Olympus, so let me introduce as well the company I work for. Um, we are well known uh, in the market. We're actually a market leader for products that see and treat in early diagnosis and minimal invasive therapy. And uh, maybe for some of you uh, knowing us uh, from their personal cameras or for, from their microscopes, these are two business units that we have divested in the three years um, on the road of our transformation. So let me give you a little bit more insights on Olympus, on what drives us and as well what um, uh, this can, can be restrictions and opportunities for business process management on the way forward. So um, everything we do, we do with our passion for true to life. And um, this is something that as well drove me to implement business process management at Olympus. Uh, to make sure that um, we um, help Olympus uh, on our mission statement and our vision. So, As a global uh, leading medtech player, um, we are serving with several contributions to patient care. So we have uh, over 100 diseases and conditions that we can treat. And uh, our focus is, and I will tell you this later in our business process model, is um, uh, very much centered around uh, diseases. Uh, so here, top three cancers uh, are in focus of treatments and diagnosis. And with this um, at heart, uh, the patient need and the safety is everything that drives us in our operation. As well, to give you a bit of uh, understanding about our size, we are um, have a global presence. We are still transforming into a global operation. Um, with over 30,000 employees and a presence in 38 countries. Um, we currently steered in five regions, uh, the Americas, uh, Europe and Middle East, China, Japan, and Asia Pacific. And these five regions are currently set up in their own process architecture, in their own system architecture, in their own organizational um, architecture. And that gives a challenge for us to basically live operational excellence and to drive efficiency and um, global process uh, rollouts uh, going forward. If you look a bit on our business division perspective, um, we are operating in two main business divisions. One is endoscopic solutions and one is therapeutic solutions. As well as the split uh, in two business divisions, you can see in the way we do uh, the production of our product, uh, the distribution of our product. So one is more kind of capital investment, the other one is more consumable. And um, that drives complexity into almost everything we do in terms of life cycle of products, in terms of um, sales uh, in the market. So as well, these requirements are important for us to understand complexity on the business process architecture. So if you look into the distribution across regions, I already shared with you, we operate in five regions. You see as well um, a distribution with um, North America or Americas as such being uh, our biggest market, um, Japan and Europe following, and then um, China emerging and Asia Pacific emerging 
on the roadmap. Uh, so with this um, and the understanding of our system landscape, you can imagine the complexity and the imbalance we have to manage when it's about global process design. As well to understand like what has been driving us in the last years um, and what is driving us currently is a um, transformation journey for sustainable growth. So um, in the last past years, we passed a phase where we focused on simplified. This were, um, for example, the phases in which we as well looked into our portfolio and have divested the consumer camera business and the microscopy business. Um, we as well worked on Transform to Perform, which was a program to look into global functions. So how we do IT today, how we do uh, finance today, how we do HR today, but as well how we can see quick wins on operation like supply chain and requirements on our quality management system. This um, has been in scope of the transform to perform. In the shift to growth, we are now um, basically focusing on um, the product uh, safety and uh, sustainability. We are as well driving further innovation for growth and productivity. And we look in general into expansion of our business, uh, into a strategic M&A, um, into the care pathway and enhancements uh, with a very, very strong focus on product quality and into intelligent endoscopic ecosystems. So um, in, in the business focus, um, this um, strategic value pools um, are describing our long-term uh, strategic growth path. Now, maybe to start a bit with operational excellence, um, I have been driving operational excellence in the almost last 15 years and basically had a lot of different angles on operational excellence. One of my first um, interactions with this term was to look into shared service opportunities. So how can you, from um, a business perspective in your sales and marketing and your supply chain division, identify shared services um, which you can ideally operate from a kind of remote setup, so potentially in shared service centers in low-cost countries or in central hubs. And um, with this, uh, basically redesigning processes to fit into an operational excellence, into an operating model that leads to excellence. Um, as well, later, I've been uh, um, working in uh, IT, looking into digitalization, where obviously the striving for excellence is very important. And maybe um, here I was for the first time confronted with a very different understanding of operational excellence. Um, so I created a kind of picture for myself and, and used this uh, ongoingly to, to basically engage on operational excellence. And let me share this picture with you at this occasion too. So when I describe uh, operational excellence, uh, I actually speak about efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, I always say there is a kind of phase one. And then this first phase one, I talk about a maturity. So when functions had come to me and say, hey, Sarah, I want to drive operational excellence, um, I basically say like, hmm, do you understand what you do in your function? Do your employees understand what they do? And in many cases, this is actually the first gap that we try to close, giving them an understanding about um, what the employees do, documenting a kind of process architecture, and business processes uh, in their scope. And then when you just uh, document the business process, it pretty much automatically comes to the point that they understand the complexity of input and output in process modeling. And they ask themselves like, what happens before? And um, they try to optimize in a kind of end-to-end -end way. And, and here we look into this uh, typical um, improvement methodology like Kaizen, like uh, Lean, like Six Sigma but as well into a general standardization, harmonization. And what this makes for the employee, what is the difference that makes in phase two for a comparison to phase one is actually that the employee understands what they really need. So how does my input need to look like so I can show performance and what do I need to give to the next party um, to work with this output I deliver to them? Um, this end-to-end -end process improvement is a lot what we currently still see um, as a necessity for operational excellence. But for me, that's not operational excellence. So when I talk about operational excellence, um, I basically describe this in a phase three and beyond. And that's actually when the employee is really focusing on the value adding part, when the employee takes uh, ownership 
to create comp competitive advantage. So this is when the process is freed up by all its ways. So we employees not copy pasting any data anymore. Employees not looking into um, um, kind of uh, business rules based execution of the process. But the employee basically says, I prevent things. I proactively uh, interact uh, to bring things back uh, back on the road. And I mainly focus on satisfaction. So I satisfy my customer, I satisfy my internal customer, or I work on, on um, bringing a value, an insight to someone to make better decisions and um, to basically improve uh, what we want to do, for example, in the business. So going through operational excellence means for me going through these phases and um, where to start. Yeah? So for me, the best place to start is actually to get a big picture uh, of your operation or to describe your operation in a big picture. And I translated with, um, I shared a little bit about Olympus before, but I translated this picture into a um, quite handy, easy to follow and read um, language, um, which is now describing what we need. And let me just read this out loud for you. So it's uh, more a story than a picture. But we take a patient need. I've shown you before the picture of the diseases of the three cancers we focus at. And when we really understand this patient need, then we develop products for this. This is software, this is hardware, these are solutions and services. And um, in the medtech uh, regulated uh, market, we are not um, just simply selling this product. So we have to make them fit to the market. We have to run through regulatory processes. We have to potentially as well make the market ready to use our medical devices. And that uh, product to market phase is very important for us to create um, an early readiness. Then uh, when we have the market readiness, uh, we basically translate everything we want to do in a go-to-market strategy. So do we want to sell our medtech devices face-to-face -to, -face to the customers? Do we want to go with our distributors? Do we want to have actually an omni-channel engagement with our customers or our to-be customers? So how do we go, go to market? And then when we have defined leads in our go to market, then obviously we do the business to do uh, to create an order and uh, we deliver from this uh, order uh, to the customer and generate cash with this. Around this here as a manufacturer, we as well plan, source, make, deliver and repair products. And uh, when we have uh, gained uh, cash, we uh, here are very committed for patient safety. So we invest this into patient safety in order to make um, our mission come true. And um, this operation picture actually guides us now in order to translate strategy actions, cross-functional interfaces, end-to-end -end processes um, in uh, the interest of our market uh, and customer requirements and in the output of um, what we promised to the market about the um, satisfaction of our product. From this picture, uh, maybe a level deeper, and uh, maybe as well to um, the use case of GBTech, uh, we actually use uh, the platform from GBTech um, as from the high level going down to a business process. And we as well um, are testing and uh, implementing in areas uh, here, cross-functional needs. So for example, risk management, for example, um, application um, that are used in the processes. So you see here some small pictures and I think Mark will guide you into this a bit more um, at, a, at a, a later part of the presentation. But this helps us a lot um, to start with this early maturity phase, so phase one employees know what they do, they understand their business process. It helps us as well with the end-to-end -end view when we are looking into um, what is happening before my process, what is happening after my process, and in the process architecture. And it's helping us as, as well in the operational excellence phase when we are looking for automation, harmonization, digitalization opportunities, and uh, where we even execute processes out of the big process design platform um, and um, with this, uh, have automation on the on the uh, on the process um, platform. So this is uh, more the technology part, uh, but behind the technologies, there's as well a methodology. And um, especially when we talk about continuous improvement nowadays, this is a lot about digitalization. And 
Uh, I experienced this myself. This is not something you can follow in a playbook or in a kind of a red thread. So usually um, you need to define for yourself what kind of steps and iterations you want to take. And this is a bit how we have explained this internally um, to our stakeholders and how we are training them and enabling them as well to harmonize processes. In general, we follow um, the logic to think big, but to start small and to do iterative steps to get to a goal. So let's uh, start reading this a bit complex slide. From the left, we have processes as is. So today in Olympus, uh, these are tons of variants of a process. They don't necessarily met at, match at all. Right? So they maybe don't even have the same starting points. But when we look into the first wave of continuous improvement, we try to look um, on digitizing the processes. Digitizing means wherever I do something manual today, I try to do it automated. So I use basically robotic process automation, or I use, um, we work a lot with Office 365 environments. So um, I, I use some smart automations to basically harmonize components as a starting point uh, for my process improvement. Then in the second phase, I go from a digitized process to a digitalized process. So now I define a happy path and I actually try to take this components that I previously have maybe disconnected into a flow. And I, I'm not still optimizing the entire process and digitalizing the entire process, but I digitalize what I can. So here I would, for example, strive for a process execution that helps me to to look, overlook a process on a specific part. And I try to actually as well look on what this overlook brings me. So this gives me mainly more reportability or transparency that allows me to put for now, for example, from a regional execution to as well understand a global level. And um, it helps me to learn about this uh, harmonized art, um, artifacts. When I have learned this, um, then I'm actually ready to go for a harmonized process. And this goes a little bit in line with the role of, of global enterprise solutions, um, where we then uh, really understand how Happy Pass looks like and how Happy Pass works. And our mission on the Happy Process part is really to go and achieve a, a higher 80% standardization. Um, and um, with this, to focus uh, the capacity of our human involved in the process really on value adding. Um, of course, uh, th that um, sounds uh, very technical, yeah? and um, we have, as well as I mentioned to you, provided a lot of training to our organization. Um, and as a Japanese or a company, so Kaizen is for us uh, in, uh, kind of part of the company culture. But when we explain to the Japanese colleagues a bit more modern technologies like design thinking, for example, they struggled with this a little bit, and they try. We try to look for the right um, uh, methodology that actually fits um, into the culture and high consensus culture, so high alignment cultures. Not very typical to American, um, and to the complexity that we have, which makes consensus even more challenging. And uh, we actually just cover it um, um, the Kufu, which is as well as Zen um, uh, philosophy, which looks into um, doing improvement but from another angle. So not actually striving to improve something you already do today, but try to rethink what you really want to achieve and redesign. It's very comparable to a classical design thinking methodology, but it's, it's really taking the attempt of not improving what you do, but improving what you need. And um, here we actually um, uh, created a workshop formats in which we do classical process analysis, classical process design and, and implementation with this uh, KUFU methodology and um, achieve a very, very high satisfaction from the participants of these workshops um, that rate us on a 4.8 uh, from five being uh, the highest satisfaction, um, as this really makes fun. It's a really a new experience uh, to, to put in the center of um, the, the scope for process improvement, not this next step of iteration, but really this what is needed. Uh, and usually that's customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction in the process. Um, we as well offer a lot of um, services around this, and this is a bit this 
think big and start small picture um, to help now uh, consistently drive in our ecosystem the improvements. And uh, this is really about um, uh, giving the organization a capability and a solution uh, tool set um, that drive focused and fast evidence-based actions. Um, and this is uh, making the processes uh, stay live and up to date uh, after they are initially set up. So we had a lot of experience with we run a project and after the project, no one continues uh, uh, to improve make processes visible, so especially um, in terms of process mining, looking into what is actually really happening in the process um, and not just measuring the output. Then uh, I don't want to read out all the things, but really looking into um, how we can accelerate and, and how we can sustainably drive improvement. Click the wrong button. Apologies. Was it me? Yeah. I want to go to the next slide. Yeah, and then uh, this is actually the handover point uh, to Mark. Uh, so maybe Mark, you can walk us a bit into GB Tech and explain the other side. Uh, um, I explained the customer uh, the customer side, and, and you can take um, the vendor. All right. Yes. Super. Sarah, thank you so much um, uh, for this. Uh, and uh, again, uh, thank you for <laughs> staying up this early uh, or late, uh, however you call it. And uh, uh, have, have a rice wine on us uh, uh, once, once we are done with the presentation. Uh, so thank you uh, so much. And uh, I just need to have the capability to share my screen. Then I will do so and start off uh, telling you a little bit about the uh, technology part um, of uh, what we just uh, seen um, in a moment and I will share my screen in just a second. Wonderful, here we go. And now you should see my screen and you should see the X uh, between Olympus and GB Tech. Uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Sarah, again, and thank you for APQC for inviting us and having us uh, showcase a customer example um, in the operational excellence environment um, using our software. Um, the GB Tech piece, um, I will just explain. Um, in the next slide and give you a little bit about the background of um, who is the company, what is the technology part of what Sarah has just explained and presented. And before that, just a few words to myself. I'm Mark Stromberg, one of the co-founders of GB Tech, have been in business post management for over 20 years, uh, actually have been supporting organizations setting up business process management system, operational excellence um, systems, uh, center of excellence in the BPM environment. So have been doing very much operational works and, and throughout the years, my, my role changed a little bit uh, from the operational part to being a key account manager here at GB Tech and also uh, presenting our software solutions to interested uh, parties. Um, and actually, I know APQC from way back then. I think uh, in the first weeks when I started in BPM, uh, APQC was always uh, all, all, all already around. Um, so congratulations uh, to APQC to have such a steady um, name and brand uh, in the market. And uh, I think it's uh, even um, uh, more important uh, than ever to use uh, frameworks, to use uh, good practices, best practices in order to not reinvent the wheel. Um, just a, a background about who is GB Tech. Um, we have been in the business post management environment uh, yeah, for many, many years. Uh, started um, actually in 2006, 2007. Um, are the vendor of the software BIC, BIC, um, that actually uh, you saw a screenshot uh, of uh, in Sarah's presentation, software for process mapping, process analysis, process intelligence, governance, risk, and compliance, and um, uh, these days, uh, so important process automation. Um, and I will just give you a little bit uh, more background about it in just the next uh, slides. 
Um, we also um, offer governance, risk, and compliance uh, capabilities, which is actually becoming even more important um, in these days, more requirements, more certification requirements from all sorts, um, uh, more documentation um, need. And therefore, uh, it's a nice uh, addition to our uh, process um, mapping uh, capabilities. We are doing uh, business um, worldwide, and Olympus is a wonderful example um, where I, I, I love your, your phrase, Sarah, uh, think big. Yes, uh, our software is called Big, actually, um, with, uh, spelled a little bit differently and start small. And Olympus actually started small with Big. Um, it was a, a very small business unit, actually, uh, in the quality management department that started using Big uh, many, many years ago. And throughout the years, um, the usage of, um, of BIG throughout Olympus grew and grew. And uh, with Sarah and her team in the last years, actually it spread throughout uh, the entire organization. And now uh, we, we moved with Sarah to Japan. And uh, now BIG is actually managed uh, from Japan, but for the global organization. And uh, this is also important for, for other customers or for interested parties, you don't need to start on an enterprise level. It's actually almost not possible uh, to do that or very, um, you need to have a very good plan to do it um, uh, enterprise wide, otherwise uh, start in smaller uh, pockets and then convince users um, that there's actually a value in, in using software that I will just uh, explain you in the next slides too. We are industry agnostic. Um, yes, Olympus is one of the global med tech leaders, uh, but we also have customers from any other industry. We have public organizations using the software, uh, private uh, global Fortune 500 um, organizations, but also many universities and colleges. So uh, quite interesting for anybody who has an interest to understand his or her processes um, even more uh, in detail. And if you have not known GB Tech before or our solution, you see some of the uh, logos there, Gartner, Capterra, G2. Have a look at these organizations um, and get uh, some more information about what our software actually is all about and what other users think about it. And this is just the right keyword, uh, our software. It's the big platform business information center. And it's module-based um, serving different uh, use cases. And um, I will just give you a brief overview about the software. And in the next slide, I will point a little bit more of why organizations use BIG in um, the uh, context of APQC. Uh, and there are quite a lot of um, use cases and value-adding capabilities that you can use once you actually start um, or if you already use uh, the APQC in different uh, matters. The big design piece on the left side, this is where it typically starts off with uh, lots of customers. Either they map processes uh, or they mine processes. Uh, this is a, the um, getting the, the processes uh, right and document and understand processes in the first place. So this is... Uh, uh, a very, very important piece where we offer a database repository based uh, process management tool uh, where you actually store process information in a, in a very structured way. Um, it's database, therefore you can analyze, um, you can um, simulate, uh, you can um, report on things. And there are many, many use cases why organizations these days uh, start off using um, a process mapping tool, and um, it could be for just process harmonization, standardization, we heard about that from Sarah. How do you want to come to terms on what is our common way, our common process at Olympus when you are a global company, when you have more than 35,000 employees, um, and uh, therefore a central repository that documents and shows processes in a common way is just wonderful and does a wonderful job to uh, actually bring everybody on the same uh, page. Um, yes, you can use it for uh, IT implementation or updating yeah, S4, SAP um, updates uh, to sub for HANA or implementation of Salesforce. Um, this is something that's also a quite common use case, uh, but of course, enterprise architecture as well. 
The second pillar, the process execution is becoming more and more important because once you, you have a good understanding of your processes, you have defined your to be processes and you identify that these processes are either still being done or run very manually or via Excel spreadsheet, PDF, Word template sent out via Outlook throughout the organization. Um, this you can do much better and much more digitized with a tool like Big Pros Execution. It's a no-code, low-code application that actually sits on top of the design application. And therefore, um, organizations that have started documenting their processes in Big Design can very easily and very fast um, uh, with a citizen developer approach automate processes in a record um, uh, time actually and showcase that um, the to be process actually works and that it brings value and that we have an ROI calculation behind it. So this is really something that once you have a certain maturity and process management, you think about automation, you think about optimization, and this is what execution actually serves. Um, and the GIC part I mentioned before, governance, risk and compliance. Um, if you need to adhere to certain laws, to certain regulations, there's always um, the arguments and the use cases that you need to showcase somebody that you manage risks, that you manage controls, that you have a decent processes in place to manage these things in a life cycle. You have findings um, and you have a task to be done. So uh, we offer uh, out-of-the-box solutions for internal controls management, for enterprise risk management, for audit management. And these can be actually used all together, or you just start with one module and um, if needed later on, you activate uh, the one or the other. AI is all around the world and uh, place. You see our little RT uh, there, that little uh, icon there. So. Uh, yes, we also offer capabilities uh, that AI is supported. Um, we have a wonderful process modeler that, that does uh, a lot of things uh, for you that used to be manual work, but uh, it will be automatic um, uh, modeling more or less. Uh, we have chatbots, uh, we have co-pilot that actually take the users by the hand and walk them through the process environment. So this is something that comes with uh, the application. Um, so we also try to see where is value at um, in using AI capabilities uh, these days. As mentioned before, I want to go a little bit deeper into how are customers using BIG in the APQC uh, environment. Um, and let's focus on the design execution part. And uh, if you see the pillar now on the left side, BIG process design, um, as most of you know, probably there is a PCF um, um, a framework around uh, with different templates, a generic one, an industry specific one, and we can offer the, the templates actually in big as process structure, as process models. So if you would like to start not from scratch, but maybe with the APQC uh, PCF, we can deliver big um, also with the templates of the PCF. And this is um, either for those organizations that start from scratch or the ones that already have processes and now want to somehow map and compare, okay, what does the PCF um, uh, tell us about um, the processes in, uh, in procurement or in marketing or in development. Um, uh, process governance is a um, super important piece. Yes, mapping is important, but we need ownership. Uh, we need to have uh, users and responsibles uh, agreeing um, on uh, this is the right content in making sure that process design, process mapping is not just a one-time trick, uh, but you need to continuously update processes um, and make changes and somebody just needs to be responsible for making sure this is happening. And uh, of course, you don't want to do this um, sending out PDF flowcharts uh, via Outlook. No, we have integrated workflows that support the process governance piece, actually. And of course, we have a decent versioning. We have an archiving. Um, and uh, like Sarah said, they are in a highly, highly regulated industry. You need to archive uh, process content for many, many years, and you need to showcase uh, to stakeholders what was the difference between version one and version two, and all this stuff actually comes uh, with the software out of uh, the box. 
And on the execution side, um, I don't know who actually has been using the maturity model of APQC, the process audit um, ideas uh, that uh, you get from APQC. Yes, you can do it with spreadsheets. Yes, you can do it with Word documents, but you can also do it with big process execution. If you want to automate processes like a process audit, please do it. And it's done very quickly, very fast. And you always have full transparency and monitoring capabilities. Where does my, my assessment sit? Where does my audit sit? Who's responsible for um, the next task in the audit? Um, so you can very quickly use uh, processes um, that have been more than big for automation and for uh, execution. And at the end, uh, once you actually come um, to an end-to-end -end design, we will also see a screenshot later on. Uh, we can also automate um, the different processes that are already in place or being done in different applications. And we will just orchestrate those processes end-to-end -end by using big process execution. Just uh, an overview, since uh, um, I, I learned that we typically don't do live demos here, but I'm happy to actually to showcase everyone who is interested um, uh, the big tool in a live session and uh, come to that a little bit later. But here you have a first impression how the software actually looks like. You saw with Sarah's presentation, there was a very detailed flow chart with a swim lane, BPMN, with responsibilities, risk controls, um, inputs and outputs. This is more of a high level diagram. And of course, this is could uh, be or is the, the entry page of the APQC PCF. Um, reference model on the highest level. And of course, in the template that we uh, can offer to you, actually you can drill down to the further detailed uh, processes, but it should, uh, we will keep it um, uh, on this level today to just to let you uh, know that a database, the repository based tool like BIC is all about, yes, documentation and, and creating understanding that is so important that we all speak a common language. Again, look at Olympus, 35,000 employees. If ever, everybody would be doing process design differently, nobody would understand each other. So we offer the templates, the graphics, the, the common symbols, uh, one central repository for bringing everybody on the same page. And on the right side, you see that it's not just about the graphical presentation, but you can add more information to those uh, graphics that you have. You can uh, define a, a sh short summary about what we see here. You want to document the governance, who is responsible for this process overview, who might be the quality manager that need to assure that everything is um, quality uh, approved right here. And this is actually what uh, the big tool comes out of the box with a set of templates to design processes, either manual, either AI driven uh, with a set of metadata. So you can um, put those information into the tool and actually um, link it to the process. And then you have all the information here in the different repository information. So everything that is process related, you will find here everything the artifacts, the documents, the KPIs you will find in the so-called object catalog. And in the visual presentation, it will uh, come all together. And last but not least, the software is very, very easy to use. You can um, roll it out easily. You don't need the specific training for the ones that will just communicate or collaborate or read. Um, we have a 24 seven learning hub that will support this, but this is essential. Um, the software also caters to the non BPM expert, because we don't require to understand BPMN, to understand BPMN. And uh, how we do that, uh, please check out our demo or, or get in touch with us. So um, in essence, why would you use a BIC for APQC? Why do customers already use uh, BIC for, uh, for their APQC initiatives? It's a central process repository to store all process uh, related information in it. And the content can be created in BIC, but we can also import stuff from other applications. Either you already have uh, map processes, we can import them, or you have dedicated uh, applications for risks uh, or for IT uh, applications. We can just have a dedicated interface that imports all this stuff into uh, the BIC tool. So we don't have to have um, redundant information and always synchronize with uh, the other applications. 
And uh, once you have a central process repository, I can only repeat myself, and I heard Sarah say this quite a lot, it's all about process understanding because this is the basis for everything that comes next um, for onboarding users, for defining uh, the good things in the process and the things that you want to automate. Um, if uh, you don't understand what's going on today, how do you want to um, optimize end-to-end uh, -end processes? So this is such an important part and piece that uh, you have a decent software that supports this process understanding um, in a way that all users, not just the expert, understand what is uh, going on. Yes, it provides um, the APQC framework, as mentioned, out of the box uh, and the different facets that we have. Um, you have the capability to create not just your uh, management, operating, support processes. Uh, we've seen the screenshot here before. Uh, but you can also create end-to-end -end flowcharts. And I think most of you or a lot of you have, have already had initiatives going from this more hierarchical or department oriented uh, de design of processes to a more end-to-end -end process. And I always say this is not an either or. In BIC, you can have both and you just use the central uh, repository to create different views on the same content. Here's a more hierarchical presentation of processes. Here's the end-to-end -end presentation, but you don't create redundant information. You just uh, point to the different content from different views, as we call them. That's quite important. Um, and, um, and typically, um, I guess such a question will come up today. OK, once you use the APQC framework, is this like uh, 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 created in stone? Do I have to follow it 100%? Um, or can we have some flexibility because our organization has got some different maturity or we need to start from someplace else? Um, and this is what the last bullet point shows. Yes, uh, we deliver it out of the box, but you can, of course, adjust it, adapt it um, on, your, on your own needs. And maybe even some processes are missing and you want to add your own content that's uh, quite easily done. Next slide is just a different view, uh, same software, as I mentioned before. Um, and we also uh, just uh, borrowed this screenshot from, from APQC. Um, this is actually an end-to-end -end view, um, and it's almost uh, uh, the, the same content that we saw before in just a different visual graphics. And like I said, we don't need to create the content new, we just present it in a different way. And this is actually what the software does. It offers for different stakeholders, different views. And when you remember that little swim lane screenshot that Tara showed you, um, I know it will be a, a tough one to explain everybody in the organization how BPMN swim lane uh, uh, is, works and what does it mean. And uh, the wonderful thing in the big software is that uh, we offer capabilities that translate this BPMN swim lane presentation into, into different views that cater more to the non-BPM experts. So you don't need to learn BPMN swim lane modeling and, and reading uh, to be able to, to understand the content. Um, so this is very, very important. Um, and the last piece, um, of course, KPI and process performance management. Uh, BIC is a database tool with the different pillars, the design piece, the execution piece, the GRC piece. Uh, we've got lots of automation capability inside the software. Uh, and the moment we actually support in creating data, in, in, in importing data, we also offer capabilities to monitor, to monitor things that are going on. Uh, we just discussed in the beginning, okay, the process maturity assessment needs to be done. Where do you store the ratings for the maturity assessment? Um, how do you, how are you able to showcase if you have gotten different or better uh, since the last assessment? Um, if you want to automate processes and want to showcase, okay, yes, before we did it very manual, we did it outlook based uh, with uh, or email based, based on templates that we sent around. And now we have it as a digitized process and we can showcase that it's now running more smoothly, faster, uh, users have better transparency where the process actually right now um, resides. And uh, therefore, uh, this is uh, the basis for showcasing um, the um, before and the after. And of course, in the, in the risk field, you see, see that little table 
uh, uh, right here, uh, it's always important to have ratings on your on your risks and showcase um, how we uh, far how how far we have come, what has been changed uh, throughout the the different periods we have been working on. Yes, I think that was my my last slide uh, for today. No, actually not. We have one more. And uh, like I said, I typically love to present uh, to uh, interested parties the software in a live demo. Um, and therefore, we can do that, of course, uh, with me, with my colleagues presenting it to you. But if you want to try it out for yourself, happy to do that. Uh, go to our website and uh, have uh, access to the demo systems. But we also are happy to showcase you and explain you the different APQC features, capabilities that I explained. How can you leverage BIC to actually speed up your APQC uh, initiatives? Um, happy to do that in a one by one um, if you are interested in. I see Madison back in action. So, <laughs> Madison, uh, uh, do we have some comments, questions here? And uh, yeah, thank yeah, you for, for the attention so far. Yes, and thank you for the presentation. We have had some questions come in, so I want to start with one. I think this might be for Sarah, I'm not sure, but what systems and controls were implemented to sustain the improvements that were made? Mm -hmm. So we have a, a variety, we, we call actually um, this uh, kind of process uh, technology stack. Um, uh, I think Mark has captured a little bit as well. So the uh, platform that GB Tech is offering has a lot of these components, but actually for Olympus, we have this a bit scattered, I would say, maybe as well a bit more fit for purpose because we are um, on very different dynamics and maturities in the different areas of, from let's say process mapping for which we use big mainly uh, to um, a kind of smart automation capability where we have a variety of tools um, then to a process mining and process intelligence um, um, tech stack. And um, I, I, I don't want to share any providers here, but uh, as I think what, what tells you this is we, we have at the moment is still scattered. I observe the market very active and uh, obviously see that there is more and more platforms that offer more capabilities. And I think that's a really good opportunity for people or for companies that haven't yet developed a mature st tech stack to look into one platform that lets you learn um, and uh, that helps you basically to gain capabilities within your own organization until you see uh, the need for adding more onto that. We run this technology stack since four years uh, at the moment um, at Olympus and <clears throat> it will take some time until um, we basically reach a maturity to say, now it's worse to have one platform. Now it's worse to to uh, replace our, for example, RPA robotic process automation platform and integrate it into this. Um, so that's that's really what we are currently thinking about. This. Great. And then I think this one is for you, Mark. Um, they wanted to know if data can be exported from your platform to Power BI for reporting purposes. Um, medicine, the answer is yes, and this is something that customers already do, and there are different ways in, the different ways in doing so. Um, could be a very manual job, okay, I just want to export the data and just uh, put it uh, manually into my Power BI, it could be an automated job that you uh, say once a week, please transfer the data from BIC into Power BI, uh, or even in a higher frequency, Yes, not an issue. And it could be Power BI, it could be any other uh, BI tool, for example. At the export, maybe just elaborate a little bit on this one because I mentioned the import capability. Um, we have, well, we offer dedicated import and export capabilities in different data formats. Um, we offer dedicated um, interfaces to some of the most common applications that customers have. Yeah, you can imagine the Microsoft stack is, is used globally with lots of our customers and we have different out of the box connectors uh, to the Microsoft platform, um, but also to uh, some ERP vendors. And to make it even more flexible, big offers an open REST API uh, technology. So uh, users can actually do uh, integrate uh, big with their other applications on their own, uh, as long as the other application also offers REST API technology, which most of the 
um, application these days do. So quite a lot of flexibility there and how to integrate BIG with other applications. Sarah, we have a participant that's wondering about the implementation and you were talking about improving the maturity. They wanna know a little bit about what it took in terms of time and resources, such as who helped design the architecture, who helped with the mapping, et cetera. Yeah, so um, I shared with you before the, um, the three phases of our strategy um, and uh, we have been um, uh, going into the second phase where the global functions have uh, thought about, okay, how can we drive globalization in the functions? And, you know, I think you always need to look into at what time and what um, circumstances you use and introduce such a methodology of business process management and such a tool uh, here. So for us, it was um, the need to see where can we and where have we, have we uh, to optimize our global services, our global uh, processes in IT, in finance, in HR. So this was almost all at the same time. And they all came with a bit different dynamics. So for example, supply chain, they had um, logistic problems and they wanted to get control of their logistic processes, especially in trading uh, and, and, and um, connections to uh, trade uh, limitations. And um, they basically started with um, their process architecture and then they identified those processes that should be done locally those processes that should be done regionally and those processes that should be done globally. And they then designed global processes, uh, so global standard operating procedures and uh, regional and local. And um, we enabled really the organization. We, we did a very broad training uh, of um, uh, analysts uh, that could then uh, design um, in the process mapping mode. Um, another function was rolling out a global application for HR. And um, it was then uh, for this purpose really starting with a high level global uh, architecture and then uh, really building the blocks. And uh, they have as well planned releases. So they used a global uh, process design team to, together with the regional um, um, and pro process experts to design uh, global processes on this new platform. And yeah, so we followed a little bit um, the, you could say the approach we do not do BPM for the purpose of BPM, but we do the BPM for the business value. And the business value in this was always a limitation or challenge where business process uh, management could help. Great. I think there is a question related to this with the setting the process methodology, right? So maybe I should capture that too. Yes, if you want to go ahead and do that, that would be great. So we used our internal um, intranet or uh, our uh, SharePoint platform to build a hub uh, there for, um, let's say, different levels of engagement with us. First, uh, awareness, and we pretty much openly communicated this in newsletters. We did a lot of uh, Digibyte sessions in our uh, digital academy. Um, so not only um, sending around newsletters and PowerPoints, but really engaging with the people and presenting, demonstrating the tool uh, technology stack. And um, then we uh, defined uh, specific training programs um, with, uh, as well with the help of uh, GB Tech to start with, let's say, I can do business process management, I can do Lean Six Sigma process improvements, um, and then I can do digitalization. So in, in course as well uh, of our um, phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, we offer a different training set and a very customized rollout for each function. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, we had another question come in about the platform, Mark. So can it cope with different languages or how does that work with the harmonization of processes in countries using different languages? Yeah, I think uh, it, it has two parts again to the to the question. The one is the technology part, is, and the other one is a little bit the, the governance part. The software itself actually is multilingualism uh, capable, so you can document the content in I think more than eighty nine languages uh, in parallel if you want to do that. Um, and the user face is also available in many different languages, so um, you. Typically, and when you remember that that overview chart or the swim lane chart that Sarah showed you, 
there's always one process and this process can be displayed in different languages. Um, and the, the topic is then, okay, who's going to translate? Um, you can either, either do it um, manually, you can use um, uh, import export capability, or you can use an AI uh, capability actually to translate it, uh, which we also offer. Um, so the technology part is covered. Uh, we offer this out of the box um, and even with the uh, translation part, but it's just a matter of um, to define how many languages do you want to support? How many languages do you want to maintain in such a tool? Because uh, with each language more uh, effort comes into play initially to define the language and also to keep up with the translation service. So that is then more the governance uh, piece. Um, I see another question, maybe I can just add on, how can we test your application? You have seen it, there's a free demo version available, what kind of processes? Uh, the tool is process agnostic, uh, any kind of process support, uh, uh, core processes. Uh, there's no limitation in the level of detail. You can start on a very generic level, can drill down to the bits and bytes of a process uh, as well. So it's just a matter of uh, you uh, deciding uh, what and how do you want to use it um, for. And, uh, um, and as we mentioned, we offer a big, uh, on a global scale, we use data centers around the world. Uh, we have partners, we offer service uh, capability. So for details, please get back to us and we can um, showcase how that might work for you. Great, thanks, Mark. We um, are about out of time. So I wanna ask one more question, which I think is a good one to end on. So for organizations that are not as process driven, what would your first steps look like to start helping or to guide the organization on building that operational excellence? So the, this answer is easy for me because actually you think uh, Metric is very uh, process driven. It's not. It's a very <laughs> uh, hand uh, made, handcrafted business, manufacturing business. Yeah, menu with the hands. Uh, so we have a lot of manual processes uh, and um, as well from a size uh, and dynamic, it's very slow. Um, but I would always look for order to cash. Yes, yeah? so start with the big tickets. Uh, they are pretty unique. Every company is doing an order to cash. Every company is doing a source to pay. And usually these processes are by nature very cross-functional. Uh, so here you would immediately gain some synergies in awareness of um, yeah, how you could move from phase one to phase two. And um, I did uh, create our process landscape uh, myself by translating the strategy. So I was taking an ear on what our executive officer said, like, hey, we have to increase our time to market. So what does it mean time to market? Where do I find this? And this is how we crafted basically the model. But I think a very, very good start is always uh, to look uh, at process models like the APQC model. Uh, so we use this as well very much and uh, basically from here translate and then customize. So, you saw some of the synergies or some of the things pop out um, because they really uh, are oriented on such a industry process model. Great, I know we're right at the top of the hour. So thank you, Sarah and Mark for presenting and sharing your stories today. As a reminder, all participants will get a copy of the slides in the recording via email within a few days. So watch your inbox for that. Of course, connect with us on all of our social media sites, and we look forward to seeing you on future APQC events. Thanks again to GB Tech for sponsoring, and we'll see you on our next webinar. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.